Hi, I'm Alex, and this is a short summary of our poster presentation at COSIGN 2021. I want to start by thanking all my co-authors, Aaron, Isabel, Sarab, Krishna, Lisa, Simon, and Scott. So the topic of our work is broadly about animal-to-animal -animal variability. And as we all learned in grade school, variability is a foundational concept to understanding biology. Uh, in neuroscience, some of the best known work on variability has been done at the level of single cell biophysics. Here I'm showing you recordings from three Purkinje neurons with similar firing properties, but which have vastly different sodium and calcium current densities. There's also a very well established literature on behavioral variability in neuroethology. So the example paper cited here shows that there's uh, idiosyncratic odor preferences across fluke flies um, that arise naturally. So overall, these kind of results are very important for our understanding of how neural circuits and behavior adapt and evolve. Uh, but in systems neuroscience, animal-to-animal uh, -animal variability uh, is still poorly understood in a lot of cases. So broadly speaking, what we're interested in is characterizing the activity of large neural populations. And this is because if you look at the activity of individual neurons, they're often very diverse and difficult to interpret. So here I'm showing you recordings done by Mark Churchland in primate motor cortex across a set of arm reaching conditions colored by different uh, shades of red and green. If you pause the video and look carefully, you'll see that each of these four neurons have uh, very diverse and multiphasic responses. But a key point of their paper was to show that neural coding is more interpretable at a population level. So here I'm showing you low dimensional embeddings of firing rate trajectories using a variant of principal components analysis. So what you can see is across these three animals, you obtain similar looking plots, and the hope is that this is indicative of similar population dynamics. So our poster investigates three basic questions. First, how should we quantify animal to animal differences in systems neuroscience? So for example, are these three animals here uh, really the same or are there subtle differences that we can pick up? on? Uh, second, how can we do this analysis systematically across very large cohorts? Ideally, we'd like to have statistical methods that are scalable to tens or even hundreds of animals so that we can really make a systematic analysis. Uh, and finally, uh, do we find interesting signatures of variability in real biological data? So at a high level, when we talk about quantifying differences across animals, what we really want is to come up with a function that takes in a pair of individual animals and spits out a similarity score or a, or a distance score. Uh, more precisely, <clears throat> the input to this function is going to be two matrices of neural populations recorded. So these are recordings over the same set of experimental conditions, but obviously the neurons in each animal are completely unmatched and distinct from each other. And what we hope to see is that there's a population level structure that is common across the two animals. So for example, there might be some low dimensional manifold of activity. But because the neural axes aren't aligned across animals, we can't just measure the, the raw distance between these two manifolds. So what can we do? Uh, there's actually several options that you'll find by looking through uh, the past literature on this topic. Um, one simple approach is to use linear regression to predict one of the data sets from the other. And there's also more uh, sophisticated methods such as representational similarity analysis, canonical correlations analysis, centered kernel alignment. And the approach that uh, we describe in our work is most similar to Procrustes analysis, which is listed at the bottom. And in some sense, uh, our method is a generalization and extension of Procrustes analysis. So the basic idea is to apply a rotational alignment and then compute the distance between the two um, recordings or the two manifolds, if you will, across um, within this aligned space. So we can either use a typical Euclidean distance between vectors to do this calculation, or we can use the angular distance, which is inversely related to um, a kind of aggregate correlation coefficient. But what you should be asking is, you know, is this a justified method for quantifying differences across animals? And um, you know, one of the contributions of our work is to, is to argue that, yes, uh, this is a rigorous method. And it's rigorous because we can prove that it um, satisfies uh, three properties that we would like in a distance function. So these are, one, that distances are non-negative. Uh, second, that distances are symmetric. And third, that distances satisfy the triangle inequality. And this is the, the final one is the kind of trickiest and um, hardest to prove and satisfy. So intuitively, the triangle inequality means that the direct path between any two points is always the shortest distance. And this is super important because it makes sure that all pairwise distance relationships are self-consistent with each other um, when we're looking at three or hopefully tens or hundreds of um, animals in our cohorts. So I don't have time to do an in-depth comparison to other methods, but the punchline is that the triangle inequality isn't satisfied by most existing methods. 
And we're also able to derive some interesting extensions of Procrustes alignment. Uh, we're able to model noise in a principled framework, and we're also able to allow for nonlinear alignment functions, so not just rotational alignments. Um, so quickly, I want to move on to our second question, which is how can we analyze large cohorts of uh, experimental subjects? So suppose we have k animals. Well, what we can do is compute the pairwise distances between all animals. So this gives us a k by k matrix of uh, pairwise distances. And then using this, using the fact that the triangle inequality is um, embedded in that distance matrix, there's a variety of off-the-shelf methods that we can use, such as hierarchical clustering, multidimensional scaling, t SNE, U map, et cetera. Um, in addition to this, we can also define the notion of an average dynamics across subjects. Uh, so we can actually compute this average, and this might be useful if measurements from individual animals are, are very noisy. We, we still might get out like a, a very smooth uh, neural trajectories from this. And since we can compute averages, uh, we can also extend methods like k-means clustering, which basically alternates between computing within cluster averages and then a step of relabeling clusters. So we can um, extend methods like this using our metric. So the important point is that all of these uh, population or cohort analyses uh, leverage the triangle inequality. So for example, if the triangle inequality were violated, we could get into situations where animal X is close to Y and Y is close to Z, but at the same time, animals X and Z are very far apart. And this kind of leads to contradictions in things like clustering, where um, you would like to put X and Z in different clusters, but at the same time, you want to put X and Y in the same cluster and Y and Z in the same cluster. So this is why the triangle inequality becomes important. So that's all the time I have. Um, but if you stop by our poster, I'd be happy to show you several applications of this method to data from primate motor cortex, uh, artificial networks, and rodent navigation. And finally, here's a list of references that are you know, interested and relevant to our work and which we're building upon.